we've been talking about relapsing and progressive uh, MS. And uh, the first question I want to address, why we're actually uh, talking about that uh, as if they were uh, a separate thing. Um, and so the first thing is that um, when this is what I call the Hollywood version of relapsing MS. So you have no symptoms at the beginning, okay, and then you develop symptoms. Uh, that may be limping, an episode, or a weak bladder, or um, an optic nerve inflammation, and, and then um, you have no symptoms after that, okay? So that's what we call a flare-up. And in fact, sometimes that happens, but more often, um, in the course of things, uh, what happens is uh, that you get symptoms, and then uh, uh, you have relapse, and then what we call a remission, so relapse um, subsides. And then uh, uh, this happens, you have another relapse, and there's a, it's much rather what I'd call a, a shade of gray over time, because some symptoms don't completely resolve, but they uh, leave a residual uh, problems and so it goes on. Okay, so this is um, uh, what I'd uh, call stepwise progression. Okay, so relapsing, remitting uh, MS with stepwise progression. And then there's obviously problems that are more insidious and that are often not even considered part of the MS. Okay, and, and I think there's an incredible uh, willingness often by people with uh, with the disease to accept that they're aging whilst they're only in their early 30s okay and uh, they think well I don't can't hop on 10 times on one foot and that's kind of due to aging it is not it's due to MS if you have MS okay so um, here's a list of these uh, symptoms fatigue is obviously a very uh, a common one but also forgetfulness can can be one um, what we call declining or cognitive speed, so multitasking is less uh, straightforward than it used to be. Uh, depression is not uncommon, sexual dysfunction, uh, temperature sensitivity, I think we discussed this um, at one of the tables earlier as well. And if you want to look at this um, in, um, in numbers, then this is uh, from a study that looked at people at the very earliest stages of MS and even though it's not apparent, perhaps, to even to the individual or their environment, if you do a testing, um, then you find that over half of people at this very early stage already um, have uh, difficulties in, uh, in cognitive speed or multitasking, um, as it were. So here's a list of similarities and differences between relapsing and progressive MS. So first of all, um, to say MS affects really everyone differently, but it remains one disease. Um, disease progression is the continuous decline of function is due to accelerated brain and spinal cord tissue loss, and that is part of MS even at the very early or relapsing stage. Conversely, elements of relapsing MS are clearly evident in many people with the diagnosis of progressive MS, you find sometimes stepwise decline there as well. Um, these elements then include um, tissue loss due to inflammation, so the mechanisms that have been discussed in the first couple of talks um, in the brain and spinal cord, and there is clearly no difference between an early inflammatory MS and a later stage uh, degenerative MS. It's both together with variations in the um, sort of, um, manifestation of both. And um, there, do, there are differences, clearly, between relapsing and progressive MS, and they are determined by the de degree of tissue loss that's already taken place, uh, the amount of loss, or thereby the amount of lost and retained what we call brain reserve, so the capacity to repair, and then there's an element of neuroanatomy and uh, length dependency of nerve fiber function. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Now you've seen, you've seen this before, the EDSS, a standard uh, tool with which uh, efficacy of uh, treatments are being assessed. And here's the time scale at which 
people on average arrive at these various stages if they are untreated um, and where currently the um, inclusion for um, treatment trials ends is anywhere between 6 and 6.5. So this is people who either use one stick around the block or are largely confined to a wheelchair. And that is um, obviously has a direct impact on whether treatments are available for people at this stage of the disease because if they are not tested beyond uh, 6 or 6.5 they will not become available as a standard at least and um, because the companies won't even won't apply for a license and uh, therefore it's very difficult to actually get on these treatments. So um, I think it's <coughs> important to remember that there's obviously a life if you are sort of in a wheelchair, okay, so and, 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 and there's also um, lots of things to enjoy, to uh, continue doing, etc. if your uh, legs are not working so well. Um, and we've summarized that in a recent uh, paper, and you can see these two hands sticking out there, um, that um, we, um, uh, the, uh, what I've just explained, the upper ADSS limit has simply led to uh, the, the, the result of nobody having um, access to disease-modifying treatment. And we don't think that's fair. Uh, we also know from people with the disease that um, their upper limb function is very important for them. Uh, um, we did a survey about this and, and it's very clear that this is not kind of just our idea, but it's very much what you actually um, describe. <coughs> so now I want to just um, briefly mention a couple of aspects that make us quite confident that um, even um, if your legs are not working so well that there's effective uh, treatment and effective impact on other functions possible. Okay, so one of them is um, neuroanatomy and some of you may have seen this little picture on the right which we call homunculus, so little man and that is a reflection of the functions that are associated in the brain with um, the body parts that are affected. Okay, so you can see the, the mouth and the face is obviously a very big um, re uh, representation as has the hand and arm, whilst legs have a, a smaller proportion. Okay, so you can say there's a higher number of fibers or neurons, nerve cells, available as a default that you can protect um, uh, longer than those for the legs. And another aspect is important that most of the tracts as a result that connect the brain with the spinal cord actually terminate at the neck level of the brain, uh, or sorry, of the central nervous system. So they are not available all the way through down to your legs, they end uh, up here. Um, so, I thought one can um, illustrate one of uh, th this point further by uh, just thinking about a road. So, if you have a longer road to travel, then you have a higher likelihood or a higher potential risk of having an accident, okay? A shorter road, I mean, it depends a little bit on the type of road, I suppose, um, on the quality. But um, when you have a longer uh, um, way to travel, then there's a higher likelihood of accidents. When you have a disease like MS, where lesions occur uh, along a road, then that lesion can occur at any point and affect uh, longer tracts um, that lead to the legs um, at any point there. But if you get a lesion um, at, um, at a level <coughs> where um, the, the, the tracts for the upper limbs are not involved, then obviously you don't have an impact on upper limb function. That's what we call length dependency of, um, of disease progression. I hope that makes sense. Otherwise, ask at your tables or ask me during the, um, during the break. Um, so this is the backdrop of what we call our Think Hand campaign. We've done a video um, promoting that as well. And you can obviously visit us uh, at, on our blog. Um, I think one aspect is really important that 
uh, that expectations must be realistic, okay? So, um, and, and I want to illustrate that point by some more um, uh, data from our own uh, research. This is a spinal cord on the left side, and um, on the right side you have a little picture of Natalia Petrova. She did um, the study as a PhD student, and what we've compared there is the number of nerve fiber tracts that are retained after a life with MS. Okay, so we have a long-standing collaboration with the MS Society's tissue bank at Imperial uh, College. And what you can see here, even with a naked eye, if you're close enough on the lower two pictures, it's comparing a spinal cord of somebody who doesn't have MS and uh, with somebody with MS and the difference between them uh, is illustrated here. It's minus 60%. So over a life with MS, you lose about 60% of the nerve fibers in uh, your spinal cord, okay? So that is um, clear that at what, it, it depends on what's, at what stage of, this, um, uh, of, of the um, disease you are, how much you can actually recover in terms of function, okay? So to illustrate this, so you can, Try and delay worsening by shutting down the inflammation at that point. You can try and sort of stabilize the disease at um, this uh, point, and that may be feasible with the treatments we have and that are upcoming. But um, to be uh, to improve or even recover function will be very challenging. Okay, so we probably need more over and above what we have uh, available at the moment. So um, this is the list of um, drugs or um, treatments that um, are available for people with advanced or progressive MS. Um, so it doesn't go any further like that than that, <laughs> okay? Um, until very recently at least, because there's one drug that has just been licensed um, for um, progressive MS, a specific type, so-called primary progressive MS, about 10% of people with, uh, with the disease are affected by that. It's licensed in Europe and the US and, and elsewhere. We're not quite sure whether it will become available through the NHS because, again, uh, of um, cost-effectiveness considerations. And I'm just gonna uh, put a few further names out, which are rather prompts for the discussion around the table. But uh, some of you may have heard of the simvastatin, which is now in a phase three trial led by um, a colleague at Queen Square. Um, then there's the biotin study, or vitamin H, which um, um, some of you may have heard of or even uh, ordered uh, biotin over the internet, which you can do. Um, then there's what we call sodium channel blockers um, that have been tested and need to be taken further. And there's finally um, Chariot, which is a, um, a trial we are uh, hoping to get funded uh, with a drug that uh, we think is promising uh, for this purpose. Uh, now, this is not all sort of theory. Um, here's um, an example of Craig, Craig Milverton. Some of you may know him. He was the uh, jazz physician, or uh, jazz physician, <laughs> jazz musician of the year in 2010. <clears throat> and uh, this was the same year he was diagnosed with MS. <clears throat> he has participated in, at our center in the Oculizumab trial, and he's still on it, so that's the oratorio study since 2012, and his EDSS has essentially remained stable, and he attributes very much that he can still play, uh, he's obviously playing the piano, um, to uh, being on the treatment. Now this is uh, Chariot, uh, so that's another drug called Cladribin to halt deterioration in people with advanced MS and the key difference um, here compared to all other studies that are out there is that we will focus on people with an EDSS of 6.5. So that means two crutches to walk 20 meters or uh, less than that. And um, it's quite straightforward because the drug is given in a, as a short course of treatment um, in two years. Uh, it has a number of um, uh, potential benefits which are all listed here, that it's been, that's been licensed in relapsing MS. It um, 
also has preliminary evidence in people with progressive MS. It's very convenient because it's a, a drug that can be uh, given over a short course with a long-term uh, effect and it penetrates into the central nervous system. So um, we think that is uh, of potential benefit and it's quite safe too. Um, right, so we have about 25 centers across the UK who hopefully will participate in that. And we've only a couple of weeks ago now submitted the application uh, to, for doing that. And um, with this, and without further ado, that's it from, from my end. Please ask questions now or during the break or later, whenever.